So first, let's talk with uh, using AI to determine the best material for a specific application, uh, which is our first article. It's out of Carnegie Mellon University. Some researchers, uh, Dr. Bharati Faramati, um, their team is doing a great job with using AI to help mechanical designers choose the correct material when they're designing something. And I can tell you from personal experience, um, it's almost impossible. It takes a ton of time. Um, even if you limit yourself to using just a certain type of material, there's different blends, there's different additives. Um, there's so many choices, basically, in which material you use for a certain part that it makes the decision process really, right. really difficult. Um, this team from Carnegie Mellon have developed an algorithm to help engineers uh, pick the right material based on what they're going to use it for. Um, and they fed it data from experiments and then also from simulations to allow to, their material library to be like a lot wider than current algorithms are used. So... Uh, at, at least to my knowledge, if you want to build something like that, where you can have material properties be extrapolated for different conditions that you want to put it in, you have to have experimental data, right? So how are they, how does their model behave with a material that doesn't have a lot of data out there already? Yeah, so current algorithms use existing experimental data, um, and that's how they choose which material right. you should use. This team from Carnegie Mellon like I said, they've included simulated data. And how are they doing the simulations? They're actually inputting the chemical compounds, the chemical makeup of each okay. material, and basically simulating on the molecular physics level um, how a certain material will perform, uh, like let's say in terms of their mechanical properties. And the way they do that is by looking at the electron configurations. And it's super smart because electron configurations basically where the electrons are located in clouds around the nucleus of the atom, that's a really strong predictor of what the mechanical, what the physical, what the thermal properties are of the gotcha. end material at, the, at its end's use. So um, instead of just using a material that only has experiments done on it, it can look at ones that have similar electron configurations because that means that it will have similar experimental results. Got it. So they're, Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, so they're, they're using that experimental data and they're adding a layer of reassurance using the electron configuration to understand how the material behaves and the parameters that you give it. And it helps them be more accurate with given experimental data. And it also helps them fill in the gaps for materials that haven't been tested yet. You can look at things that are similar to kind of extrapolate what it might do under a given situation. That's really cool. Now, Dan, um, how do you think this fits with the current hot topic that is generative design and mechanical design as a whole? Well, so for those those that don't know what generative design is, um, it's essentially a tool that allows a mechanical designer, someone using their uh, product design or mechanical design tools in, uh, on their computer to select what they want the overall shape of a part to look like, what maybe what material they want right. to use, um, and what ma manufacturing method they're going to use. And generative design takes that information and basically optimizes the part, creates the optimum shape for the certain ma manufacturing method for the given materials. Um, if you were to tie an algorithm like this in, it would basically make a uh, you know more seamless end-to-end -end solution where you or I could just come up with a shape and an end use for a certain part, and it would select the material for us, it would sh select the actual details on the shape, and it could help choose the best manufacturing method. Um, basically removing a lot of the, you know, what I would say is like getting out in the weeds with the technical stuff when you're wanting to design. That's fair. And I'm guessing this would make, open it up a little bit and allow people that don't have a ton of mechanical design experience to kind of start dabbling. Yeah, it could definitely um, lower the hurdle to entry in terms of, you know, going from a sketch of something that you like on a sheet of paper to a real product in real life. Um, I kind of liken it to no code tools for building a website. Um, so personally, I don't code that well. I don't know a lot about com like software engineering, but I can build a website today. I can drag and drop and choose what I want to build. And at least for building a basic site, that works perfectly fine for me. And I don't have to learn the full stack of all the software engineering that goes into building a website. I kind of think that this technology combined with generative design could provide a similar solution for hobbyists or people that are just picking it up. Um, and what makes me really excited about it is that there are a lot of creative people out there um, as we lower this hurdle to entry, I think we can get a lot more creative ideas, a lot better products once people don't have to worry about all the technical uh, challenges that come along with building. Absolutely. Um, I'm 
personally looking forward to um, Dr. Bharati Farimani's research and his team's research making its way to commercial products. So if you're from Autodesk and you're listening, or if you know anyone from Autodesk that's listening, definitely reach out to them. I'd love